I'm very happy today to have here at the Wonderfest studio in the Gamma sector of the Milky Way a most celebrated and uh, erudite astronomer, Professor Alex Filipenko of the University of California at Berkeley, is here to answer our tough questions about energy in the cosmos. And our first question today, Alex, first, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Question number one. Why do the stars shine? Well, Tucker, that's a very interesting question. And the first thing to realize is that stars are just very, very distant versions of our sun. So when you ask, why do the stars shine? You're actually asking, why does our sun shine? Well, our sun is made primarily of hydrogen gas. And in the core of the sun, the temperatures are so high and the pressures are so high that the electrons have been stripped off from the protons. So the atoms are no longer these bound atoms. You just have a bunch of free electrons and a bunch of free protons whipping around. And at the high temperatures and pressures in the sun, occasionally two protons can come so close together that they bind together due to what's called the strong nuclear force. And at that moment, also one of the protons turns into a neutron. So you get a bound entity called a deuteron, a proton and a neutron bound together. It's a heavy form of hydrogen. And then through a series of reactions, two more hydrogens can come in and the end product is that you fuse these things together and form a nucleus of the helium atom. Now, the electrons aren't bound to this thing because the temperatures are very high. It's a free nucleus. But four protons have essentially come together to form two protons and two neutrons in the form of the nucleus of a helium atom. And that nucleus has less mass, it weighs less in a sense, than the four protons of which it originally consisted. So you have four protons forming a helium nucleus. That helium nucleus has less mass than the four original protons. The mass difference through E equals mc squared is turned into light. And that light gradually makes its way out of the sun, finally escapes, comes to the Earth, comes to the other planets, is spread throughout the universe. And that process of converting four protons into a helium nucleus many, many times per second is the energy source that drives essentially all normal stars. Hello, I'm Landon Curtinol, astronomer and mathematician, and it's my pleasure to ask Alex Filipinko and good colleagues some additional questions regarding energy in the universe. Um, so Alex, what is the dominant form of energy in our universe? Well, the dominant form of energy in our universe right now, surprisingly, is something that we call dark energy. We don't actually know what it is, but it's kind of a repulsive form of energy that's causing the expansion of our universe to accelerate, to go faster and faster with time. And this discovery was only made in 1998, so prior to that, people didn't think that dark energy was the dominant form. They thought that dark matter might be the dominant form, followed by visible matter. But now we know that dark energy trumps both dark matter and normal matter. And it, it, it encompasses something like 73% of the total matter plus energy of the universe. And by that I mean, if you take a sufficiently large volume, like maybe a billion light years in diameter, it doesn't matter where you take it, but big enough, all right, and sum up all the different types of matter and energy in that volume, 73% will be in the form of dark energy, 23% in the form of dark matter, and only 4% in the form of normal matter of the type that you and I are made of. And every other billion light year diameter sphere is the same way. So it doesn't matter whether the universe is infinite or finite, or whether we've seen the whole thing or not, we haven't seen the whole thing. The average density we think is the same everywhere, and everywhere we think over a big enough volume, 73% of the energy is dark energy. One frequent question I'm asked about the Big Bang is, where did the energy for the Big Bang come from? Did we get something out of nothing with the Big Bang? Or in other words, did the Big Bang violate the laws of conservation of energy? Ah, why do we exist? You know, if it all started from nothing and we exactly. are, we're all here, how can that possibly be? There's an amazing fact, and that is that our presence, the energy within our bodies, the energy associated with our mass, is exactly balanced by the negative gravitational energy 
that is the negative energy associated with our gravitational attraction with everything else in the universe. Now this may seem a bit strange to you, but I can illustrate it with an apple. I can have an apple starting from rest over here, and I can drop it. In our reference frame, it has zero kinetic energy, energy of motion to begin with, and it picks up one, two, three, four, five units of kinetic energy as it's moving down. So have I created energy from nothing? Did I get something out of nothing, even just dropping the apple? No, what has happened is that as it falls, it picks up negative one, two, three, four, five units of gravitational potential energy. It gets closer to the center of the Earth. It becomes more tightly bound to the Earth. That's a negative energy. So negative one, two, three, four, five units of potential energy plus positive one, point, one two, three, four, five units of kinetic energy gives you zero at all times. So if you define it to be zero here, it's zero at all times. In a similar way, our energy, the energy associated with our physical presence, is balanced by our negative gravitational attraction for all other particles in the universe. And so in a sense, we balance out our existence through this gravitational potential energy, as in the case of the apple. And this holds for all objects in the universe. So you can really think of the total energy of the universe being zero. It started from zero. It's still zero. Fortunately for us, there are positive parts, you and I, you know, and there are negative parts, our gravitational attraction for everything else. It all balances out. It's amazing. Well, so let's talk about the positive part. Um, will the universe ever run out of Useful energy. Ah, uh, yeah, useful energy. You know, useful energy is the type of energy with which we can do things. Like, the energy poured out from stars can be used to power solar cells and things like that, and it heats us, and it is used by plants through a process of photosynthesis. Eventually, stars run out of fuel. They die out. They become dim. And although new stars can form from clouds of gas and dust between the stars in the so-called interstellar medium, they too will burn out someday. And as more and more of the gas and dust gets used up, there will be less and less of it available to form new stars. And so eventually star formation will pretty much cease and eventually all the stars will burn out. And so they won't be providing any useful energy. There are other forms of energy like radioactive decay of various nuclei. They too eventually will all decay away so there's less and less useful energy in the universe with time. And if the universe lasts forever, yes, it will someday run out of useful energy. It'll die in a sense. It'll still be there, but nothing interesting will be going on in the universe because of the lack of useful energy. You previously talked about dark energy and dark matter. And someone hearing those words might think, you know, are they related? For example, can you convert dark matter to dark energy and back and forth. Right. You know, we call them dark matter and dark energy, both because we don't see them. They're dark in that sense. And also they're mysterious. We're not really sure what the dark matter is, and we're even less sure what the dark energy is. So they're unknown. They're mysterious. They're dark in that sense. But given that we've been talking about dark matter for decades now, it's a little bit regrettable that the term dark energy is being used to describe this stuff that's accelerating the expansion of the universe. Because if there's one equation a lot of people have heard of, it's E equals MC squared. And I'm continually being asked, are dark matter and dark energy essentially interchangeable? Can they be converted one to the other? And as far as we can tell, the answer is no. Dark matter is a gravitationally attractive substance of unknown origin, probably mostly consisting of particles left over from the Big Bang. Okay, little subatomic particles. We call them WIMPs, for example, mm -hmm. weakly interacting massive particles, <laughs> although they've never been detected. Okay, um, and, and dark energy is something different altogether. It's got an overall repulsive effect on space. It causes space to stretch faster and faster with time. And based on our present knowledge, they seem to be completely unrelated. And we don't know of any way to convert one to the other. So in this case, I would say that E equals mc squared says that, yes, there's the mass equivalent of dark energy. If you could find a way to convert dark energy into mass, you'd have this mass equivalent. But we don't know of any way of converting dark energy into mass, either into dark matter or into visible matter. 
So that 73% of the universe, you said, which was dark energy, you know, that seems like that's an awful lot of the universe. And yet, we only discovered it recently. Why did it take so long for us to discover most of the universe? Yeah, the dark energy is 73%. Now remember, that's averaged over enormously large volumes where we used to think there wasn't anything or not much of anything between galaxies. We now think that this dark energy is everywhere. So if you add it all up in all the things that we previously thought were empty space, it dominates the universe. It does not dominate our sector of space, this room, okay? Our solar system, our Milky Way galaxy, our local group of galaxies, it does not dominate any of those things. It's a minor constituent of relatively small volumes of space. So it's very difficult to detect. Indeed, in a laboratory setting, we've never detected dark energy. We only detect it when we go out to extremely large distances where the cumulative effect over vast distances begins to dominate over the attractive effects of gravity. So we didn't find it until 1998 because the right types of studies had not yet been done. We only found it by looking at objects that were many billions of light years away and noticing that the universe is expanding faster now than it did a few billion years ago. And will that expansion or acceleration of the universe accelerate the point where we don't have enough useful energy to do useful things? Well, you know, the acceleration is moving galaxies faster and faster away from us. So it's diluting the energy of the universe, to be sure. As long as our sun is shining and we live near it, we will have the useful energy of our sun. But when our sun dies and when most of the stars in our own galaxy die, by that time, all the other galaxies, or at least most of them, will be pretty far away. So the, the overall useful energy in the universe will definitely have been diluted. And if the universe lives forever, which we don't yet know is the case, I mean, the dark energy could someday become, repul become attractive and, and bring the universe back down in on itself. But for now, we don't know that that's going to happen. So if we assume the universe expands forever, then indeed the amount of useful energy will essentially go down to zero. When you understand the laws of physics, Penny, anything is possible. <laughs>